This is F. Paul Driscoll with another episode of Opera News' is Sightlines, and my very exciting guest today is Lisa Davidson, who is here in New York rehearsing for the Marshallin in Der Rosenkavalier at the Metropolitan Opera. Lisa, welcome. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm so excited about this. <laughs> <laughs> We're very excited too. Rosenkavalier opens on the 27th of March this month. And is this your first Marshallin? Yes, this will be my role debut. Okay, but it's not your debut in Strauss, obviously. You had a big success as the prima donna and Ariadne at the Met. Um, and Four Last Songs is obviously becoming a signature piece of yours. Would you talk a little bit about how Strauss feels to you? What's it like to sing it? Why is it that sopranos love it so much? Well, we always joke about the fact that composers must have had this sort of one muse or this... Uh, kind of varies, you know, these sort of certain characters of, or, or mm -hmm. people in their lives that met a lot or could do these things that they wrote. And I think first of all, it's either he just knew a lot about the female voice or mm -hmm. he listened to it a lot or had someone who sang it, you know. Um, and I find with Strauss, every time I start with the new role, such as this one, you start from, from scratch and you sit down and think, oh, but this, this will never work. This is so tricky. And then why that rhythm there? Why this? And then it doesn't work and my voice gets tired. And then over time, by repeating and repeating, it comes together like a hand in a glove. You know, then it's like, ah, of course. And then it can't be different. And I find mm -hmm. that to be, I'm surprised every time. But now I, I should learn because this is what my third role of uh, Strauss and I've done so many of his songs. But then it's it's so natural and it natural in the sense of the way he combines this this text and the way he says it and the sort of the connection to the to the German text as well. Um, so it's hard to describe what exactly it is that he does, but the the the, um, the combination of things and when you repeat it over and over again, um, it, it just it fits in a way. Is the character something that um, you? Uh... Let me let me phrase it in a delicate way. A lot of older sopranos like to sing to Marshall and <laughs> because she has that big long rest in act two. And you're quite young as far as Strauss sopranos go. So are you looking forward to singing this role for a long time or you? Yeah, I must yet? say, uh, I mean, Rosen Cavalier was the first opera I saw um, yeah. like ever. Uh, and I never thought I would ever sing it then, mm -hmm. but but then when when I started singing the soprano repertoire and when when I realized I could do Marshall in, it's been it's one of the few that I've really 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 wanted to do. And um, mm -hmm. I think we suggested quite early to to Peter Gelb uh, if, if there was ever an option, <laughs> and then this this, <laughs> this came. Um, and uh, I I hope I can sing it for a long time. Like as I said with the four last songs, I've done them already quite quite some years and it will mm -hmm. I hope this is a role that I can can bring with me it's um as you say it has that break which which makes it a less vocally demanding and not not that it's not demanding but it's not ox sure. it's things like mm -hmm. a machinery throughout the whole yeah. um and and that makes it um a doable role uh, over time as well so far in your career, I mean, you've obviously had great success in Wagner and in Strauss, and you've got your uh, Verdi coming up next year at the Met. Is there a favorite role that you have so far? One that you felt, ah, this really, this really suits me, and this is my comfortable shoes, as it were. Well, I think maybe Ariadna became that because I did uh, that role quite early, and then yeah. I have sort of repeated it, mm -hmm. uh, and also with Elisabeth and Tanoza, but Elisabeth. It's a different thing because it comes down to the production, who you're with, the conductor. There's so many things. But with Ariadna, of all the roles I have done, it's probably the one together with Elizabeth that I've repeated the most. Um, mm -hmm. And I really, I really enjoy doing that. But I'm, I don't feel I have repeated enough roles enough times yeah. to sort of have that that big fit uh, yet. But, um, but yeah, may, maybe, 
maybe Ariadna I so many good ones to choose from. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about how this career happened for you? I mean, when did classical singing or opera singing come into your life? When were you first exposed to it and decide that maybe this is what you'd like to do? Well, I was a very late bloomer, as one could say. Um, I I didn't grow up in a family where there were music apart from what's on the radio and uh, Christmas music, I guess, we listened to. Um, and then I got a guitar when I was 15 because I was in this little choir that they, they had a band and I thought, oh, I'd like to maybe learn and play the guitar. And when I learned to play the guitar a bit, I could also sing. And in that, it was created this room where I could express these emotions that I had, but I couldn't find a way to express them properly. And then in high school, which is um, the three years before, or yeah, before university, I started um, with music as well as the sort of the subjects you have to do to, to go to university. And there I was introduced to classical music because we had to sing and train both in classical and jazz and pop and on all things. And in the beginning, it was very scary. I, I thought, well, what is this? I ain't going to do this. I thought, I will, <laughs> I'm going to do something else. <laughs> uh, but then I started in a choir, girls' choir, a uh, church choir. And um, the world of Bach and the world of Baroque music was open to me. And, and I think from then on, I was sold. I never thought I would live from doing this, but mm -hmm. I, I sort of, I was... Uh, suddenly in, in this world that I'd never seen before and never been in. And from then on, it just went. I studied four years at the Vesta Soprano in Copenhagen. No, in Norway. And then I went to Copenhagen. And then I met the teacher there who's very popular in Scandinavian countries. Um, and also, I think she's been to Curtis, actually. Um, and she said, Lisa, you're not a mezzo, you're a soprano. So, and then I went home cried a lot, <laughs> thought about it a lot, <laughs> went back. And then, then uh, from then on, I, um, I was a soprano. So I look at it now as a development, but much mm -hmm. rather than a big change. I mean, you have the singers that has this change from soprano to mezzo or these things. But um, I, I look at it as, the, as my development. And my, it took some time with my vocal cords. Um, I'm a tall woman and I have long cords and it takes time for that to, yeah. to settle in a way. The question of the... Um... The, the training and the voice apart, I mean, clearly there's an unusual destiny for you because people almost immediately identified you as someone who would be able to sing the big Wagner roles, the big Strauss roles, the big Verdi roles. Was that daunting? Because so many young singers are told, stick with Mozart, stick with something which is going to be simpler, easier. And it seems that, you know, you were ready for these opportunities as they came up. I mean, what, how did you prepare yourself psychologically for all of this? Well, I think the good thing about not knowing what world you go into is mm -hmm. that you don't know these things, but you've been told them a million times from the people around you and they say, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. Um, and I shouldn't, I shouldn't name the name of this conductor, but it was a conductor who said to me before rehearsal, we were doing a concert together and he said, yeah, have you done Pamina? And we were doing a concert with some Mozart, like Elettra and Fiordelici, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and I said politely, no, Pamina, I have not done. Now everyone should do Pamina. And I was like, okay, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't done Pamina. <laughs> um, he, and then he sort of left it and we started a rehearsal. And after rehearsal, he said, have you done Sieglinde? <laughs> 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 and it's such, um, uh, it's such an amazing for me, picture of how different we are. And as you say, yeah. there is a saying that you should do your notes, that you should go that way. And there, that's there for a reason, because it's so friendly to the voice. It's a lighter yeah. orchestration. It's it's so good if you can do it. And I did that. I did my contest, Samato de Lice Letra. I did those things. But when I went to audition, they said, Lisa, you're you're born 10 years too late. We don't cast Moses like you for Mozart anymore. It's a different casting. It's a different world, it's a different time. And then, of course, I'm grateful for those people who gave me the Freya, the Norm, you know, those smaller, bigger roles, but still mm -hmm. within my Fach, so I could sing it with my voice. And I think I found it scary because I didn't know what to do. If I couldn't do Mozart, what could I do then? Uh, there is plenty of Ariadnes. You will never cast a new person for such a big role you know the met you cast the known people because that's how it works and the house is so big so you need them 
then you need to be at the next level of that again. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so it took time, and I think the competitions helped me a lot to sort of be seen, and then I could do the smaller roles. But I couldn't be fest in a house because there wasn't enough roles. So there was a right. lot of things in the beginning that was quite tricky to sort of find where should I be. But then I had the competitions and my agents who somewhat helped me to tell houses what I could do, like yeah. I have, or the, the, the smaller roles in the ring. And yeah, but it took time. Speaking of competitions, in the interest of full disclosure, I was a judge at the Operalia competition in London, um, which was sort of a big splash for you. And I would say from my perspective, the first time I heard you was in Linbury downstairs, which is not yeah. a very friendly um, place for uh, the voice. But what I remember in the finals is hearing you in Covent Garden in the big auditorium and your voice sounded so comfortable. Um, and Marta Domingo said, I love it when her notes fly over my head and I can just see them go by. <laughs> <laughs> but when you were in that competition, I mean, obviously the, the recognition and the applause is wonderful, but in your head, did you realize that your life was changing at this point, that you had all these important intendants looking at you and saying, my God, she could sing this and she could sing that. And, no, absolutely not. I think I thought, I did think that I was going to a huge audition. That yeah. was the only reason I applied for it. I thought if I could just get them to hear me and see me, maybe they have something they can offer me. But I mean, after after the first round, my my agent said, Liz, you have to go and get an address for the final. And I said, but I have a dress. She's like, no, you already used that. You need a different dress. And I was like, yeah, but we don't know if I'm going to get to the final. So why fuss about it? She's like, I might not know it, but I think there's a big chance. And I was like, yeah. Okay. yeah, but I didn't. And that's true. I, I I was so overwhelmed. And I I've said this before, but to describe it, we went uh, after that competition. And then I did the Queen Sonia, as you know, after the summer. And I was going on a holiday with my boyfriend at the time to Paris um and that was when my sort of complete <laughs> personal lockdown I couldn't go to the I couldn't do anything it was like the whole it was so much to take in yeah because I I never expected to be in the final I never expected to that positive feedback in a way and um and for 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 me at the time it was very overwhelming I mean I think for everyone it would have been but but yeah I hoped of course that you would see me and hear me, but I never expected it to be so positive. <laughs> mm -hmm. Was there ever a moment where you felt you had arrived and that you were actually a, a theater that you went to that you were particularly comfortable in and think, okay, I'm on, I'm on the ride now and I'm not going to get off because obviously a competition is a very different thing than coming in for an engagement and having the responsibility of doing a full role. Yeah, absolutely. And that came then afterwards. I mean, I was already planned. My idea of the board was a big sort of international step for me. And um, and I did them smaller roles in the ring in 18 in Covent Garden. And there were things that was sort of repeated and done um, throughout the years after. But it went so quickly and quite quickly or faster than I than I thought or, or sort of could take in at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe, and I think I said that in 2019 when I came to the Met, it was a weird combination of being at this place that I had been looking forward to for so long time and planned and rehearsed for. And it was the first time I could also look at it and think, oh my God, what, have, what a gift I've been given. What, a, yeah, yeah. what an opportunity I, I have with this. So um, it went fast and I sort of, I wanted to be there, but I'm not sure I was fully mentally aware of, of, of all the things I, I did all the time. And your debut at the Met was Queen of Spades, Lisa. Hmm. Um, and you were gorgeous in that. But uh, was, th was that a role that you look forward to going back to someday? I mean, it was a I hope so. success, yeah. It's, uh, it's not just an opera that is done so often. Uh, and, uh, and of course, there's a lot of Russians that can sing that role. So there's a 
it's a, and there's a different casting in that. I think it can sort of go from my voice to very light and yeah, back yeah, and forth yeah. a bit, which makes it not not uh, maybe not me as a first priority all the time. So, but mm-hmm. I hope I will repeat it. What was it like um, making your debut at Bayreuth? as someone who is spoken of as um, obviously a, a, a wonderful singer of Wagner to go to that place and take on the big roles. What, what is it like? What does it feel like to be in that house and sing that repertoire? Well, it's, I think they're a most amazing hall to sing in. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's, you can do whatever you want. You can almost sing backwards. <laughs> I mean, you can't, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's such a tentative hall. It takes everything and the dynamics you do are just supported uh, immediately. Of course, it depends on the set and all these things in the orchestra, but the pitch is so low that no matter what they do, they will never, you will never feel overwhelmed as you could do in so many opera houses where the pitch yeah. is higher and then Wagner becomes this sort of train of, of, of sound. Um, but to be there for my debut, um, that was a bit... <laughs> a bit like the competition as I said you, you come to house you do your role I had done it already I knew I could do it but I could feel the expectations um and I tried not to think about it and I, I still try not to think about it um but it was it was quite overwhelming uh to be there and I love the production so I, I really enjoyed being there but it was um it was very yeah, mentally challenging and, and amazing at the same time. So this sort of pearl wind of, of everything combined. <laughs> now that you've, you've obviously reached a, a very great level of success, I'm sure that there are lots of younger singers that are looking to you as uh, for advice or as a role model. Is there any one piece of advice that you feel is most valuable for a young singer to have as a career is beginning? Whether it's someone in your repertoire or a tenor or baritone or any voice type? I think, oh, to just give one, I always say have patience uh, because I think I think we live in a world that, where patience is, is not really a thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the speed of things is fast. We are looking for this sort of quick, 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 everything has to go fast. Uh, almost, we wish we could read books faster. If you see doing this, uh, and there is no such thing in learning something. Uh, and a singing is, is sort of, it's such a vulnerable instrument yeah. that needs this time. But in that, I also have to say that you have to put in the daily work of it. You cannot, like my teacher said, Lisa, you have this huge voice. It will take time, but you cannot sit down and wait five years and then start. You have to work those five years. Um, mm-hmm. And that's, I think maybe my sort of my advice at least for for the for the bigger voices that you have to do slow and steady stone by stone by stone and I think it goes for all voice types Mm -hmm. because it takes time Uh, it takes time to learn a role it takes time to learn a song and you have to repeat it and repeat it to to get to where you want to be is there any singer that you listen to for uh whether for pleasure or whether for instruction, for lack of a better word. I mean, is there anyone that you listen to that inspires you that way? Yeah, I have listened a lot to, I think, uh, René Fleming, uh, Jesse Norman, um, and also sort of Flagstar and and Nilsson, but in a different way. It's like Mm -hmm. also the recordings is like from a different time, so you can't listen in the same way. But I, um, I think Jesse Norman and René Fleming, it's sort of, I'm somewhere in between in terms yeah, of yeah. voice types. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so I I love listening to what they do if we do the same repertoire because I would never do the same, but the inspiration of it and the way they do it somewhat also inspires me a lot. So I think that's yeah, yeah. why I never looked for sort of my, where is my voice, you see I me, mean? because I don't believe it exists completely. But yeah. those two, I would say, is probably those I've listened to the most um, for, for for personal inspiration. Um, that I don't know if you've heard this before, but when we were at Operalia, um, Placido compared you to Nielsen very specifically on the top note in the uh, Elizabeth aria. And he said, um, you know, 
when he talks and he said this woman meeting you is a missing you know with no z it's just like the a missing with the amazing with the the s in it but he said <laughs> he said the top like birgit's goes here and you know in, in other words what he was saying was it was a, a natural progression to the top it sounded as if you weren't hitting the top you were hit you were choosing to stop there but you could have gone further oh and yeah that was, like that. <laughs> that was the quality he felt that nielsen had that you had and Amazing. you don't sound like her at all to me, but when I heard you in Covent Garden, he was exactly right, because I didn't hear Nielsen until the very end of her career, and she still was a wonderful singer, but that was exactly the quality. It, it, it's a, it comes from a place of relaxation, for lack of a better word. You know that. Yeah, it's it, like my teacher talk about the elevator in a way. You exactly. Sort of, you're constantly in the elevator, and then you choose yeah. where you want to be in. But if, if the elevator is swaps place <laughs> then you're off, you know good <laughs> in a way <laughs> what for for you as a norwegian um what is the, the position of opera in the country there because you've had so many great singers come out of scandinavia and of and out of norway i mean what is training like there in general for singers in norway that, that it has such spectacular results um i think the biggest um difference between culturally between <clears throat> America and Norway or America and Scandinavia is the fact that our schools are much more paid for by the state. Yeah. So in that there's a freedom for us to choose. If my parents had to pay for my musical education, I would never have been a singer because yeah. they could never afford that. Um, and I, I don't know, but I, I feel that in that you get those talents that would be lost otherwise. Yeah. You know I mean, there is no chance that people in Oslo could know that I like to sing and that I would be a classical singer uh, because I didn't travel to Oslo to get my classical training. You see what I mean? I got to yeah. where I was and in that I got more and more interested uh, and eventually I started singing. Um, and if I compare sort of Scandinavia to more of the rest of Europe and also maybe America, but I think that's where we might have the similarities is the joy of singing, yeah. singing to keep the, the joy of it. Um, this Meister teacher thingy, it, it exists. And my teacher was definitely sort of one of them. Yeah. But not, I was, I didn't meet her until later. And mm -hmm. that's sort of the, the joy of doing it and keeping that alive until you are fully capable to take something serious you see what i mean i'm, mm -hmm. I'm always impressed by by instrumentalists who played since they're four and they've taken it seriously since they're four but you need then the full family around you to make sure that you do that you see what i mean yeah, but yeah. with the voice it's not outside it is a part of you but it is a part of of who you are and and mentally it has so much to it's such a big part of it how you feel who you are and and how is the day? You see what I mean? And all of those mm -hmm. things, I think, uh, goes in, in, in this um, and getting better and, and sort of uh, building your instrument um, mm -hmm. because it's building your body and building, building your mind at the same time. We can't, we can't put it away. How do you, as, a, as an artist, know when to say no to something, when to say no to an offer? Let's say a role comes across, you don't have to name it, but how do you make the decision what to accept and what not to accept? Well, I have a very good uh, relationship with my my agent, Maria Mott. We have worked together since just before Operalia, actually. Yeah, I was a bit yeah. lucky with, with that signing uh, because afterwards just took off to a completely different um, speed. But I think we have had a very clear view of what's right before we even listen to other people. So, I mean, I have said early, this is the roles I can do now. This mm -hmm. is the role I don't want to do. So for her to then say, yes, yes, no, 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 has been very easy. And then there's those roles that are, ah, uh, maybe, you know, those in between. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I can sort of feel it. I like in my gut, I can go, oh, whew, no, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not right. Yeah. Uh, and then sometimes we have talked about it back and forth, um, like with the Met. I mean, I was offered some roles before I said yes. And mm -hmm. of course, I wanted to sing at the Met, but I also had to be 
mentally ready for that. And I had yeah. to yeah. be able to go to New York and be in my shoes and <laughs> ready to, to take on that stage. And um, there were some roles there that, that I was like, oh, it's sort of right, but I'm not ready. So sometimes yeah, yeah. it's voc vocally, it's easy to say no because I will mm. never do anything I'm not ready for vocally. But then it's this, especially in the beginning, am I mentally ready or will I have time to learn? That can also be a thing now mm -hmm. that I can be asked to do something in a couple of years, but then because I have so many other new things, I want yeah. to have time for it and then I won't be enough or prepared to the level that I like to be. So therefore it's a no. But often it's easy and sometimes it's, um, hard and it's sort of getting harder and harder because i'm getting closer and closer to the roles where i can actually maybe do them <laughs> <laughs> as you uh acquire more experience and obviously you become recognized as being a wonderful interpreter of certain composers in certain roles how do you negotiate taking on a role you've done before with a new conductor with a new director you walk into a rehearsal room and maybe you have a lot of information to bring to the table. How do you say, I like to do it this way? Maybe that's not, or are you completely open? How do you approach that process? I think for a stage, for a stage direction, I try to be as open as I can because mm -hmm. it's sort of useless if I constantly say, I have done this. Sometimes it's important to let them know that I used to do this. That's why I might sort of portray her towards mm -hmm. that. But I think it's important to be open because you're just a part of a puzzle see what I mean you have to mm -hmm. make sure that you take in everyone else and if I insist on going this way and the other one is going that way we will never come together right. and that is my job that's why I'm hired to to do that the the group dynamic of it uh, and musically it's the same but of course I'm more flexible when I do a new role than when I've done it four or mm -hmm. five times yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't say I'm, I'm as easy going but the good thing about doing it a lot of times is that you also have the flexibility. You can know, ah, oh, you want to do this slow, that's fine. But if you're that slow, then I can't. So then I can also sort of say that, I'm sorry, but this phrase, I have tried it before, it doesn't work, you know? But it's the same. I mean, the conductor is in charge of the whole orchestra and I want to be with them. And if I then insist on going somewhere else, we will never meet. So it's this, I'm sort of, I try to keep the dialogue as open as possible and, um, be as polite as I can and sometimes maybe I'm not so polite and then I fail but I try. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you very much for this very open dialogue this has been a joy thank for me you. and thank you for giving us the time while you're in rehearsal for this wonderful production of Rosen Cavalier which opens on the 27th of this month and this is F. Paul Driscoll for Sightlines my guest today has been Lisa Davidson it has been a privilege and I wish you continued success Lisa. Thank you so much and thank you for having me. And see you at the Opera News Awards on the 16th of April. See you bye there. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.